that, I'd like to um, uh, go ahead and um, uh, welcome uh, Lee, uh, Lee White to us. And of course, uh, bear with me just a second. I had my my cheat sheet and it, and it promptly disappeared <laughs> off my other screen as soon as I, I um, started talking. So uh, Lee, it's, it's uh, great to have you back with us. And um, uh, why don't we start by having you uh, just tell us what the heck's been going on with you guys in uh, Chickamauga, Chattanooga for the last 18 months or so. Well, like everything, it's been a real crazy uh, year and a half uh, as far as we're going, uh, where everything from when we were completely shut down to partially shut down to then just being open limited hours till now we're full blown open again uh, and trying now to, you know, push forward and uh, keep our things going there, trying to keep the stories going out. At least, you know, one thing we are managing to do, we are, we may have had to drop a lot of things we would normally do, but we've got the tours going out, which I think is the most important thing. That's great. Um, you know, while the uh, National Park Service uh, appears to be culling out its historians, uh, Chickamauga Chattanooga is blessed with two of the best historians that are still in the system, and that's, of course, uh, Jim and you. Um, uh, how long have you guys been together, and how do you interface uh, and with the other uh, historians to tell the story at this park and at uh, some of the surrounding sites? Well, uh, I've known Jim uh, probably since I was just a kid, first started volunteering. I guess I first met Jim probably around 1985 or 1986 when I was a teenager. And he actually was one that really got me to start volunteering at the park. And uh, basically set up my destiny for the rest of my life, it seems. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's been my mentor and many things over the years. So fortunate to work with him. And, you know, of course, he's just a walking encyclopedia of just about anything related to the Civil War. But, you know, Chattanooga and Chickamauga specifically. Well, you know, something that I've noticed over that time, and of course, uh, Jim, uh, as he's as he's very senior in the in the ranks and stuff, uh, I spoke with him four or five years ago, and um, uh, I said, "What else would you like to do?" Because you've always been oriented in and around um, uh, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, and of course, he has spread out, and we've done programs at Shiloh and and the East Tennessee Bridge Burning Campaign and so forth. But the interesting thing I noticed about that, of course is that when I started talking to you after we first got introduced and started to work together, is you have that same sort of uh, outreach across the West and so forth that has made you uh, kind of a, a multiple player that I think perhaps if Jim were not just so well known over so, so many years, I think certainly you would be um, uh, luminescent in your own right and probably... Uh, with the same sort of reputation Jim and Terry and Rick Hatcher and a lot of those people had. And so I think it's a, it's, it's something that uh, I suspect a lot of people are not fully appreciative of. And, and I, I'll just give an example of that, that perhaps a lot of folks are, are um, uh, not aware of. Um, you both have a lot of talents and so forth, but you published and, and Jim hasn't, um, Tell us about your publications and your fields of interest. Well, I pretty much, you know, my field of interest is wide ranging, uh, but, you know, specifically focused on the Western theater in the latter half of the war. So starting midpoint of the war, going to the very end seems to be my interest. Uh, and uh, particularly looking down at uh, soldiers' experiences, looking at, you know, the common soldier point of view, so to speak, but also you know, very specifically the armies of the T army of Tennessee and the army of the Cumberland and just how that all merged together, particularly in the latter part of the war. Okay. Indulge me one more question. Then we're going to get into uh, the, the 1864 Tennessee campaign, but, but, but I can't, I've asked Jim this and, and he's, he's given me some uh, great uh, information. I'm going to ask you the same thing. What's your favorite place and what's your favorite story of uh, out of the Chickamauga Chattanooga 
uh, park area and so forth. What, what, what hits you the most? That's hard because <laughs> it seems like it changes from year to year or month to month. But uh, one of the stories that fascinates me, and it's one actually that I covered in one of the books on the screen right now, the, in Steve Woodworth's The Chickamauga Campaign, I wrote an essay about General Alexander P. Stewart's breakthrough attack on September 19th. And that still is one of them because a very complicated maneuver showed how I, I still think in many ways that General A.P. Stewart may very well have been the only, the only general on the field on September 19th who really had a grasp of what he was doing, but how he was going to do it. Okay. Um, you've done... You know, we've, we've been affected, obviously, by COVID and stuff, but um, you have uh, done three, I think, programs for us on the 1864 uh, Tennessee campaign, and we're now ready to culminate that with Nashville and, um, and Hood's retreat. Um, what has affected you, um, what, or what, what most uh, impresses you about this campaign? Um, uh, was it fanciful? Was it realistic? What 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 is your reflections on Hood in this campaign? Well, it comes down to I don't think you know it was that fast fanciful. I think there was a real opportunity, but it was limited by time. And unfortunately, by the time General Hood starts moving, everything's starting to stack against him. And then I really see it as I and I say this many times that it was a hail mary pass. Uh, at that point, he sees that he's got the only mobile armies for the Confederacy still left in the field, and he's really the only chance at that point in the war, however far-fetched it is, that the Confederacy has. And I think that really weighs on him, you know, young man missing a leg, uh, young man, you know, young man too, at, at the age of, in his early 30s, being in command of an army of that size. And knowing pretty much that the hopes and the, you know, other Confederacy completely rest on him at this point. And I think that's a huge burden that he's going to carry forward. And that'll also tie in with what we're going to eventually cover in December at Nashville. Tell me, um, uh, with Hood, uh, this is a little off script of this, but I, but I, you, you beg the question. Um, uh, with Hood, uh, when did you, when did you start to seriously consider him, and and when did you fold him in? Uh, did do you have much thought about him uh, either before Chickamauga or um, during Chickamauga, or does your does your uh, uh, interest in Hood really uh, begin to emerge more with uh, the post Chickamauga period and? and the Atlanta campaign and, and his assumption of command? Well, a little of both, actually. I, you know, typical fanboy, I'm drawn in by the story of the Texas Brigade, you know, and all their exploits early in the war at Antietam and Gettysburg and so on. And so I kind of got drawn into him that way. And then, of course, his role at Chickamauga. I still you know, think the, you know, his leadership role at Chickamauga was one of the highlights of his entire career, and uh, also critical to the, you know, for uh, the fighting for the Confederates and that if he had not been shot and wounded when he was, it may have been an even bigger disaster for the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, and then add to it, I live about a mile south of where he recuperated after Chickamauga. So it's kind of a thing. I've, Hood's kind of been on my radar for a very long time. And... With that, um, what is your view of, of Hood uh, taking the command of the Army? And, and uh, you know, a lot of people have talked about him perhaps having backbitten or gone behind the back of Joe Johnston and so forth. Um, um, how, do, how do you view uh, Hood's performance in the Atlanta campaign uh, leading down to his selection to become the commander of the army uh, in front of Atlanta? Well, I think it's kind of a difficult story for him that he's kind of had to learn on the job. You know, he just recently promoted and then he gets thrown into Atlanta campaign, which of course is, 
having the face of the war changing, how things are being done, all the trench warfare and everything's coming into play, and he's having to learn on the fly. As far as the backstabbing goes, the one thing I'll say about that is that he wasn't the only one who was writing to Jefferson Davis, but he was the only one who was writing back to Jefferson Davis at Jefferson Davis's behest. Uh, Davis had asked him for this correspondence before he even you know, came to join the Army of Tennessee uh, while it was at Dalton. And, you know, basically when the president tells you something, Hood is trying to do what the president tells him to do. Well, you know, it's, it's fascinating that you raise that point. And, uh, and again, it's, it's, it's good. We're a little off of the script that we intended, but our, our time is moving in good order. So I'm, I'm comfortable with probing this a little further because I'd like this for the benefit of the audience as well. You raised an interesting point. When Hood goes back to Richmond, um, he, of course, is, is fawned over by everybody as he is recovering. And po politicians... Uh, like to be surrounded by war heroes. And certainly Jefferson Davis didn't have many friends in 1863 in Civil War Richmond. And so to bring the handsome young 33-year-old John Hood uh, into his carriage and into his company and so forth, not only does this relationship, and a lot of people aren't aware of this, but I tied two and two together. Back during... Uh, back during um, uh, the early operations of the war, Hood is in touch with Davis as well. He has actually written to Jefferson Davis back in 1862, and they're talking about leadership and a lot of these other things. So your point is well made. In the army of the 19th century, oftentimes the political sponsorship of people is actively encouraging the young and favored people that they know who are in the army to uh, to talk with them and to keep tabs on things. And I know for a fact that surely when, when they made a decision to move Hood to Corps Command in the Western Army because Lee had no place for him at the Corps level, that I'm sure the last thing Davis said is, keep an eye on things out there. Tell me what you think. The Western Army has never been as aggressive as you in the Eastern Army. And we really ought to be going into Tennessee. Tell me what's going on. And I think, I think Jefferson Davis facilitates that more than anything else. But having having said that, let's go ahead and go into the um, into uh, the tour this fall. Um, tell us about the armies in the wake of Franklin. Both armies okay. after the Battle of Franklin. All right, well, we'll start with Hood's army. Uh, of course, the Army of Tennessee has took, taken catastrophic losses, uh, particularly in A.P. Stewart's Corps and Cheatham's Corps uh, at, uh, at uh, Franklin. Uh, we lost quite a few veteran, leader, you know, veteran leaders at the Army level, losing Pat Claiborne, uh, losing quite a few you know, seen, uh, brigadiers that had veteran experience like Hiram Granberry, States Rights Guest, uh, and so on. Uh, but also the losses at the uh, regimental and company level are pretty devastating as well. You're going to have a lot of regiments that are going to be led by a captain uh, at, uh, at Nashville due to the loss of their, the colonels and lieutenant colonels at Franklin. So, you know, although the Army did lose a large number of enlisted men, I think a bigger blow was the losses among these veteran leaders of these regiments and even at the company level. Uh, in the Union forces, of course, the body is going to fall principally at Franklin just on the 23rd Corps. Uh, just to recap things, uh, Franklin uh, Hood faced off against his old West Point classmate, John M. Schofield. Schofield had under his command his 23rd Corps, but also David Stanley's 4th Corps infantry uh, of the Army of the Cumberland. Although, for the most part, the Army of the Cumberland troops had escaped without really being heavily engaged, with the exception of uh, George Wagner's division, who were the guys who were unfortunately caught out in front of the main position when Hood advanced at Franklin. And then, of course, uh, Emerson Opdyke's brigade being the part of the forces that sealed the breach at the Carter House. 
besides those, they're relatively unscathed. But the thing is, after Franklin, they're marching on into Nashville. They literally have marched halfway across the state uh, in the last couple of weeks during this campaign. So although they're not going to be as bloody as Hood's men are, when they arrive at Nashville on uh, December 1st, they're going to be very tired, having crossed so much ground, having been going through, many of them going you know, days without sleep, without proper rations. So when they're going to arrive at uh, Nashville, they're going to be pretty, you know, worn out. May not be physically bloodied, but they're going to be physically exhausted from this, this campaign up to this point. Okay. Uh, let's, let's focus on, um, on Hood and the Army of Tennessee between December 1st and, and the... Um, Battles of Nashville. Uh, tell us about the the army and 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 what are its options and what is it doing between uh, the uh, the day after Franklin and uh, up and through the battles of Nashville. Uh, tell us about that um, um, that period of time. All right. Well, first of all, what Hood, you know, really uh, again doesn't see much having much of an option. You know, after the after the losses at Franklin, many are like, why does he keep on pursuing? Again, that he fully feels the weight on his shoulders of whether the Confederacy is going to survive or not. Uh, if he retreats, that's it. Uh, you know, he surrendered the only slim chances the Confederacy has. So he's going to move forward to uh, Nashville, and ha- he has a plan. It's very, in my opinion, far fetched. But at the same time, it's really the only option he has other than just throwing up his hands and give it up. Uh, and that is, is to go to Nashville, take up a defensive position, and do something to provoke his former commander and old West Point professor, George Thomas, to come out of the defenses of Nashville and attack him. So he's hoping to force Thomas to do what he had just have done at Franklin somehow come out, attack the prepared defensive position, and then capitalize on that counterattack and somehow follow in and take Nashville. Uh, But it all hinges on George Thomas making a mistake, which, of course, Thomas has not demonstrated being one who has done that so far in the war. Okay. um, You talk about George Thomas, and, of course, he's been criticized for being too slow to act. Um, uh, certainly there's a huge frustration in Washington and, um, uh, and uh, uh, that translates down through to uh, Grant and, and uh, to Sherman as well. Um, is it a fair criticism that, that uh, Thomas was too slow to act against Hood uh, or is it a fair, crit- or is um, uh, Thomas justified in his delay? How do you view Thomas? I view that Thomas's delay was justified uh, because the things that several factors. Uh, first is is that what Thomas is going to have to fight with is a very uh, odd formation. Uh, he's going to have these veterans that Schofield brings in, you know, veterans of the Atlanta campaign. Uh, but again, they're they're worn out after this campaign. You know, most people always think about the ragged and uh, condition of the Confederates that they're barefooted. Well, many of the men Schofield had are marching into Nashville with their shoes falling apart as well. Uh, they're going to have to have time to rest. Then add to it, it's just on December 1st that A.J. Smith's men arrive from the Trans-Mississippi area, having been sent to Thomas as a detachment of men from the Army of the Tennessee. Uh, of course, uh, under command of the incomparable A.J. Smith, uh, one of my favorite uh, Union officers in the course of the war. There are guys who will fight absolutely everywhere during the war, it seems, except the Eastern Theater. Uh, but then he has to draw in uh, Stedman's uh, District of Etowah troops. These guys are green as grass for the most part. They're garrison troops, USCT troops that largely have not been in combat so far. Uh, so very untried and untested then. And so then in all three groups, 
having never really served together before, and uh, especially except with the exception of uh, Stedman, Thomas had never really worked with them under his direct command either. Uh, so it's going to, you know, he's going to have a large force, but it's a force that it's going to be kind of unwieldy. Add to it, then it's not going to be very long after Hood arrives that the weather is going to turn absolutely horrible for almost a week's time. Not only with temperatures getting down to single digits, but ice and snow uh, to the point that it would have been absolutely impossible to try to move an army. And of course, all this is going back to uh, Washington and Virginia, and they don't seem to really get a grasp of it. You see much of the same thing with Rosecrans and his campaigns in 1863, that the difficulties in the Middle Tennessee region just generally are not appreciated by the powers that be. And, you know, of course, then Thomas and Grant have not had the best relationship to begin with. And uh, I think all that plays into this. And then add to it, it seems that John Schofield was, had an open mic going up to Grant and writing false reports and uh, just basically trying to get himself put in command of the whole force and relieving Thomas. Okay. Um, when you look at Hood, going back to Hood for a second, um, when you look at Hood, did he have um, reasonable options other than fighting at Nashville? Um, if so, what were they? And um, would you um, perhaps speculate on those a little bit? Well, really, uh, his option at Nashville, again, was to draw Thomas out. And he starts to do, he has a good plan to try to do that. It just, again, it just doesn't play out too well for him. And that ultimately was what's going on at Murfreesboro. Although you have Hood at Nashville, you have Thomas at Nashville, your principal players, there's also this little story going on down, well, you know, about 30 miles further south at Murfreesboro. Uh, there you've got uh, Fortress Rosecrans and Murfreesboro itself which had been uh, transformed into a, this huge supply depot. Uh, this supply depot had been what it, had, it supplied Rosecrans when he moved on Chattanooga in the spring or summer of 1863. And then, you know, it had been a big part of Sherman's supply lines in the Atlanta campaign. But you've got a, a garrison down there under Lavelle Rousseau of about 8,000 men. And so this is... Uh, played out in Hood's mind, this 8,000 men is a threat in his rear, but it's also an opportunity. Hood sees that a way to provoke Thomas to come out of the defenses at Nashville and attack him is by somehow putting enough pressure on things down at Murfreesboro to concern Thomas enough to come out and do that attack. And so initially, uh, uh, Hood's going to dispatch General William Bates' division, who were relatively... Oh, well, compared to many other formations at Franklin, had not taken nearly as heavy of losses as, say, Claiborne's division or Brown's division had. He's going to send them over, and then he's going to dispatch Nathan Bedford Forrest and the bulk of his cavalry down there, all to try to force Thomas to come out of, out of the defenses at Nashville. Unfortunately, Rousseau is going to prove a stronger opponent than anybody had thought and is going to bit really. Uh, throw that plan completely out of whack for, uh, for uh, Hood. Could Hood have operated north of, um, north of Nashville without reducing Nashville? Um, uh, could he have drawn supplies or, or was um, uh, Nashville analogous to Harper's Ferry for Lee moving into Pennsylvania? Was it a place that Hood had to go through uh, or, or reduce before he'd go further? Because, of course, there were rumors that what Hood was intending to do was go to the Ohio River, cross the Ohio River, and then uh, come back in through Western Virginia and join up with Lee uh, at some point in the winter. I think that's kind of fanciful, but, but certainly, you know, what is, what is end game for Hood in this, in this campaign? Um, if he defeats Thomas, so what? What does he do if he defeats Thomas? Well, I, I do. I kind of see it both on that both ways. 
I do not see that he can go above Nashville or at least very far above Nashville, leaving Thomas's rear. Uh, you've got James Wilson's Calvary. It would tear up Hood's rear if he goes any further without reducing them. Uh, but at the same time, I think this, though, the fear of this is what's really playing on Lincoln and Grant. Uh, again, for those who write off that this is completely a fantastical thing, in reality it may be, but both Lincoln and Grant both feared that that's exactly what Hood was going to do. And they were, uh, at least Grant was very uncertain, you know, uh, that it would not be successful. Uh, he's, you know, that's one of the things he keeps hammering to Thomas and his correspondence is to act to keep Hood from doing that very thing. And, uh, I, of course, though, I don't see that Hood could do it with his logistics and his supply lines going across the Cumberland River and then being able to find enough supplies with the wet, particularly with how the weather was that winter, uh, to have any hope of success if he does not have Nashville. You know, uh, it, it's interesting. We talked a little earlier about, um, about Jefferson Davis and his arrangements with Hood and uh, uh, his discussions. And I know from looking at Davis's papers that um, uh, were, were recently completed by um, Lydia Christ and those people uh, looking at some of the correspondence back and forth. I know that Davis viewed the 64 campaign in the West as an opportunity to go on the offensive, that he wanted to go back for both political reasons and for military reasons. He wanted to stop the, the, the blood at the Tennessee River. He wanted the Army of Tennessee under Joe Johnston to find a way to come back across the Barrens and the Cumberland Plateau and bring the, the Army back into Tennessee. Well, if you take that, that strategy, and of course, that's some of the very first letters. That's why I think you find this interesting. And for our listeners, I encourage you to go back and probe into this further, because I think the relationship between military and political is always much more interesting and complicated than many authors and historians put out front. And in this case, when you talk about Hood finally getting the freedom, he gets the army. Johnston fails in front of Atlanta. Hood has Atlanta on his back. He has to defend Atlanta, but he doesn't have any maneuvering room. Once he loses Atlanta, he then sits down with Jefferson Davis and with, um, uh, with PGT Beauregard down in Palmetto, Georgia, and they recreate Davis's uh, intention to bring the army and take it back into Tennessee. And so where people have extrapolated that, that somehow Hood might go all the way into Kentucky and Ohio and then to Virginia, especially in the middle of the winter, trying to go through the mountains. I really think, quite frankly, that Hood's charter was to raise shit in Tennessee, which is what Davis wanted in the spring of 64. Hood is now doing at this point. And of course, what he doesn't get out of that is that Sherman, whom Davis had hoped to draw out of Georgia and chase Hood in northern Georgia and into Tennessee, doesn't play ball. He's got three armies, and he takes one of them with him, and he sends the other two armies back to Tennessee and says, take care of him. And of course, they do. And so it strikes me that probably in answer to this speculative question about going north of, of Nashville, I don't think Hood ever intended to go north of Nashville, and he does have an egress out of Tennessee. The, the Union has not slipped in behind him to cut him off, but rather is sitting in front of him. So uh, let me ask you this. Um, talk to us about what is probably misunderstood by everybody. Talk to us about Hood's withdrawal after Nashville and uh, what does he go and what does he do and why does he do it? Well, he's basically it's a, a move, but to, to keep his army intact and to save the army at that point, uh, you know, things fail there at Nashville catastrophically. 
uh, but could begin ordering basically a withdrawal that's going to mirror the original advance into Tennessee up from at least Nashville to Columbia. But he's trying to put these rivers between him and uh, and Thomas's army. And of course, that's where it's going to play out. You know, another thing that Thomas had been hounded about was in his delay. And one of the things Thomas had been really pushing was that he needed to get James Wilson's cavalry remounted and re- rearmed and refreshed. And that's where that's go- this is going to play a dividend for Thomas's point. Uh, but to- you know, Hood's going to withdraw from Nashville down through Brentwood, down to the across the Harpeth River at Franklin. And during this time, there'll be several real severe, uh, small but very severe fights uh, at places like Brentwood, at the Harpeth River, and other points along the, the route of retreat. It's going to be during that, though, that uh, you're going to ultimately have, at one point, Nathan Benson Forrest rejoining the Army and overseeing that rear guard action. And, and in my opinion, it's going to be probably... Nathan Bedford Forrest's finest moments in the American Civil War is covering the retreat from uh, the Duck River to the Tennessee River. Uh, you know, at that point, adding to it, the weather is going to turn absolutely horrible. Uh, you're going to have rain, sleet, snow, mud, mud, mud everywhere, slowing everything down. Of course, that's going to be an absolutely miserable factor for Hood's men, but it's also going to be a factor that's going to really stymie uh, what Thomas is going to do with the pursuit. He's going to keep Thomas being the bulldog that he is, isn't going to be re- relent, but it's going to make things more difficult as far as the pursuit goes. And ultimately, although uh, Thomas is able to have one of the biggest, uh, you know, pursuits and uh, after actions of Nashville of any army during the war, it's still not going to get to the end that I think Thomas had wished for, although it is a mortal blow for uh, much of the Army of Tennessee. You know, it's um, uh, Stanley Horn in his uh, uh, evaluation, his book about the uh, Battle of Nashville, which is not a huge book, but certainly a very um, uh, uh, fulfilling one. Uh, uh, I think people have overlooked Horn uh, for a number of years. Um, and I think that that's a shame because when you look at the condition of the army, he just, he just flat out says it. And no matter even the controversy with Sam Hood, uh, you know, defending his uh, collateral relative and, and or Wiley Swords criticisms and so forth, the, the plain out fact of the matter is, is that after the battles of Nashville, um, the Army of Tennessee ceased to be a fighting force or an offensive, an offensive weapon. And so consequently, that section of the Confederacy ceases to have viability because it has nobody to defend them. Indeed, he's got to go all the way back to Tupelo, Mississippi to get to a spot where he can draw some sustenance from Richard Taylor and the people who are now in the backwaters, because Sherman has moved on, uh, Mississippi is no longer a huge consideration. And it's from that point, of course, that, um, that Hood sits down and pens the resignation of his, of his commission uh, and petitions to be released from the command of the army. And then I think that any other speculation they take some of those forces and they distribute them. Some of them end up going down to Mobile and some of them go to Tennessee where they're trying to create a back door to protect Lee as Sherman is moving through the Carolinas. But by and large, this battle, I think, is exactly what Stanley Horn said it is. It is decisive in that it has destroyed an army without the army surrendering and I, I think that that is an extraordinarily uh, important and often generalized but not understood purpose. And that purpose, I think, will be clear to folks when they look at the portions of the retreat that you cover in this program, because this is a long ways to go to get back to safety where 
you can go to bed at night and not worry about somebody sweeping in behind you and capturing everybody. I mean, it is it is that destructive. And so with that, I'd like to uh, finish the formal part of the interview by asking you a question. And I and um, it's interesting. I said, um, you know, there have been other long marches such as Hood made. Lee's retreat from Gettysburg certainly comes to mind where, you know, we're talking hundreds of miles um, uh, to get back and get in position. The road to Appomattox is a is a hundred plus mile uh, trek uh, unpursuit and so forth. And these, of course, maybe because they're Lee, they get almost uh, uh, Homeric um, legendary uh, attributes to them. And yet nobody talks about the last long retreat of the Army of, of Tennessee. Um, do you think this is any way comparable to uh, Lee's retreat out of Gettysburg and or uh, Lee's retreat to Appomattox? And if so, why and how? But, uh, yes, to both. Uh, there's, co- you know, uh, co- comparisons you can find on both. But also the more, another more famous retreat in history, Napoleon's retreat out of uh, Russia, uh, also comes to mind as far as the weather conditions and everything that Hood's going to be facing. Of course, he's got the desperation uh, coming out that the survival of the art, you know, the survival of the army is at stake, and of course Lee is able to masterfully, you know, withdraw his men from Gettysburg, finally be able to set up that defensive block at Williamsport and all, but, you know, with Hood's retreat, the deal, unlike what you have at Gettysburg, of course, I think Ken, Kent Brown's made a great case with his recent Meade book about why there is a little bit of delay and how Meade followed the pursuit. You have basically George Thomas unleashing the hounds of hell on John Bell Hood the day after Nash, the Battle of Nashville, and the Hood's army is just going to be pressed relentlessly by Thomas, uh, through that, uh, and again, you know, his army just begins to fall apart. I, that's where I see where you see the shades of uh, the retreat from Appomattox. Uh, points Hood was trying to get to, uh, hoping to be able to have a time to catch a break, a breather. They're not going to be able to get it. And uh, again, it, I think things were looking very grim for Hood until Forrest joins him with his cavalry at Columbia during the point of the retreat. Again, I agree completely with Horn. Uh, it's hard to see a more decisive battle in the war. You really don't see many effective pursuits during the war, but George Thomas certainly delivers, I believe, an effective pursuit, especially with the weather conditions he's going to face and uh, then just the conditions that all, for both sides are having to endure during all of that. Uh, you know, it, it strikes me, in the, in the overall um, perspective that one could probably gain, if you've read Kent's book on the retreat from Gettysburg, you have a really great template to evaluate um, uh, um, the, um, the retreat of Hood all the way to Tupelo. I think O.C. Hood has made an effort um, and has actually written a manuscript on that. But when you think of the components of what Hood is trying to take away, and the man's only 34 years old, you know, you got to keep in mind we're, we're talking about a very young uh, officer. But as you look at that and you look at the components of what it took to make that happen, uh, then, excuse me, I think you get a sense as to how a civilization and, and indeed a, a, uh, a dream melts away in the, in the wake of decisive military action and the failure of it. And of course, one could certainly make the argument just as was made uh, after uh, Meade was criticized for not aggressively engaging Lee before he got across the Potomac, that one would suspect that with Hood in his very grasp and the Harpeth and the um, and the uh, other rivers, the Duck River and the Tennessee in his way, that even a moderate uh, pursuit with both infantry and aggressive cavalry engagement and Hood doesn't get, Hood doesn't get to the Tennessee. 
period. You know, he may not get to the duck if if they pursue it. So it's it's interesting uh, how that goes. Um, you've researched this campaign extensively. Um, tell the audience uh, two or three things that are widely misunderstood or exaggerated about Hood's operations after the fall of Atlanta? Well, uh, I think that the idea that the whole thing was just uh, pretty much a pipe dream, that it, there was no chance of success, is a false notion. Again, I think the timetable turns against Hood, but if he had been able to operate quickly, striking northward across the Tennessee River in, say, um, October instead of uh, November, I think you know, things could have really been very interesting in Tennessee that fall. Uh, you don't have Thomas having gathered, had enough time to get A.J. Smith over. You don't have Thomas the time to mass all these little small garrison troops together. Uh, so I think it, you know, it was a concern of, again, uh, people questioned about how viable this was. But when you look at what Grant and what Lincoln are both seeing in this, they're very worried about it. And so I can't dismiss it as, you know, we're looking at it with 2020 hindsight, you know, at the time they didn't quite see it that way. You know, it's uh, not going to be just that notion that it couldn't happen. The other thing is, is that, you know, it's kind of a false notion in all of this, I think is the idea that could just, again, didn't know what he was doing. I think he does though. I it's just, again, I don't, I think he fully something we tend to not, uh, and I don't mean necessarily our audience, but more modern scholars tend to not really put full weight in about how much all this weighs on Hood, that he has a full appreciation for what is expected of him and what Davis wants. Davis wants him to go into Tennessee, and that's what he is going to do. He's got to please the boss, because again, what happened to the other general who didn't do please the boss? He got fired. And so I think Hood fully, fully realizes all of that when he's beginning to move the campaign north. And again, I think he's also looking at the roadmap of what Bragg had done in the summer of 1862 when he had really turned the, you know, the war upside down in the West when he moved from Tupelo to Chattanooga and then threw the army, army into, up into Kentucky. You know, basically at that point, Buell has to leave pretty much North Alabama knocking on Chattanooga's doorstep and follow all the you know change, pulls the front all the way into Kentucky, and it takes nearly a year then for Union forces to get back to where they had been the previous summer. So I think that's what Hood's trying you know really playing at is trying to just you know buy time for the Confederacy and try to change the face of things at that point. Okay, uh, Sarah Ferguson has got Sarah Ferguson has got a question for you. Sarah, go ahead and ask your question of Lee. Okay, I hope this is not too rambling, but on your point, Len, of, of an army being destroyed without surrendering, th this does seem unique in that way. And I think, I mean, I don't want to say my opinion, and Lee, you're probably going to disagree because this is extreme, but um, I mean, maybe comment on the accuracy or lack thereof of this. Um, only Hood could have done this. He equated... A uh, number of men killed with success. If not enough men were killed in an action, he um, he got upset with them, and that's how Franklin happened. He was upset with his men and kind of put them to the slaughter. Um, and how could he possibly have thought there might be any success in Nashville after that, with his with his army just you know limping in against massive entrenchments that had been there for years? I mean, there is the point that, yeah, he was maybe promoted too early because he was so young and he was good at the lower levels, but not competent as the commander of an army. So what do you think about all that? Well, just as the first part, uh, he, I don't think he, I don't agree with the first part for the fact that he really thinks Franklin will work. He honestly thought it would. Uh, and really, he had no, he, I don't think, he necessarily is going to do that to punish his men. He really sees shades of Gaines Mill all over again for him. The moment that had catapulted him into the into the you know to the high you know uh, 
appreciation of the Confederacy. He sees that ha having an opportunity again. It's just one thing that tends to haunt John Bell Hood. It also just seems to haunt the Army, Army of Tennessee is that they just um, have this unbelievably bad streak of just really bad luck. Uh, things just never seem to work out for them. Uh, and he goes on to Nashville because, again, I don't think he sees any other option other than uh, retreat and giving up. You know, he, again, that appreciation on his shoulders of that the success, the survival of the Confederacy depends on him. And uh, he goes to that Nashville, try, hoping, his only hope being that Thomas is going to make a mistake. And, of course, George Thomas just tends to never make mistakes like that you know also adding to that sarah and, and listen it's a, it's a great question and it yeah. and it is uh conventional thinking um uh that that certainly is um uh has enough validity that you should uh take the question seriously and answer it seriously uh we we compared lee and his retreats and hood and his retreat and noted that um Lee's retreats are considered to be legendary, whereas Hood's retreat doesn't get a whole lot of attention. And yet you've made a point about Hood attacking at Franklin. And is there not an analogous um, uh, uh, measure of Lee attacking at Malvern Hill or Lee attacking on the third day at Gettysburg in frontal assaults? Um, I like Lee's point of view. I don't buy into all of Sam Hood's defense of, of Hood. Uh, and I certainly agree that Hood should not have come across the Harpeth River after Franklin. Yeah. I think he should have used the river as his breastworks. And I think he should have recruited from there and made Thomas do something. I think that was probably the most damning thing he did as a commander was to go over the river after having failed there. But coming back on the flip side, when you come back, uh, you look now at a, at a man who realizes that his prey is 20,000 men. That's John Schofield. Uh, his prey is not George Thomas. And so consequently, he has missed the opportunity to bag Schofield at Spring Hill. And now Schofield is straddling a river. Uh, in crossing in the dark. And that's a wonderful opportunity for an, for a, an offense with a, uh, with a defensive army retreating. Lee didn't try it. Lee stayed an extra day uh, daring McClellan to attack him after, um, after Antietam and then slipped away when it was obvious McClellan was not going to do it. But had Lee is, attempted to cross, Perhaps McClellan would have followed him. So, great question. Um, Harry, uh, let me go to another question here. Um, Harry Tate, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question, uh, Guy. Yeah, hello, everybody. And uh, thanks, uh, Lee, for putting this program on. Um, kind of curious. I, uh, I look at things uh, number wise, Trishan. Uh, so, I'm going to look at the number of Hood's um, riflemen. How many? Uh, guns is he carrying? And, and what I want to know is, can you give me some uh, numbers? That'll help give me a sense of how this whole thing goes down. I'd like to know how many men Hood actually got up to Na Nashville after the two-day battle or whatever, when he starts to retreat, how many men start off? In other words, his losses in Nashville. And then how many does he lose on the way down to Duck, the Duck River? How many got captured or fell out? And then Forrest shows up how many men does he then lose on the way down to Tennessee? I'm trying to look at the attrition rate of this army. Well, I can help you out with some as to begin with, but unfortunately with those latter ones, the numbers just aren't there. Because another thing being lost in men is the wagons with a lot of the paperwork in the army that the army has. So it's really a hard, hard to get a good firm grasp of the numbers once the retreat actually starts. But to begin with, uh, at Nashville itself, Hood is going to come up and arrive in front of Nashville's around uh, close to 30,000 men. Uh, but then when uh, the operation down at uh, 
Murfreesboro began, at first he's going to detach Bates Division down there, which is about 12 to 1,500 men. They'll be gone for part of it, but they arrive back in time for the battles. But what he loses is Forrest, which Forrest has uh, around probably around 6,000 cavalry troopers who are therefore under Hood's command, but he's got them down at Murfreesboro during the battle. And they won't return in until the uh, the uh, retreat's actually going on. Uh, against him, uh, coming out of the trenches at Nashville, George Thomas is going to bring out around 55,000 men. Uh, and that's between those forces. Of course, the quality is going to be pretty, uh, pretty wide with Smith's being and Smith and uh, Wood and uh, Schofield being largely battle-tested veteran troops. But then you're going to have about the 5,000 men of the Department of the Etowah who are largely untested. Uh, and so, but, so the 55,000 are of mixed quality. Uh, during the battle at Nashville, Hood is going to be, lose about 1,500 killed and wounded. And 4,500 captured. Uh, Thomas is going to lose just around 3,000 uh, 3, in total. And then once the retreat begins, then you're just going to start men, losing men being killed or wounded, but then also men just deserting in droves, particularly Tennesseans. Uh, you know, again, they're coming back through their hometowns uh, and knowing that they're probably not going to be back. Uh, many of them are going to take the opportunity to say, I put my time in, I'm done. And so it's going to be, you know, pretty much a skeleton force that will arrive back in uh, Mississippi uh, all around the, well, at the end of December. Uh, Hood's going to go to lose a total of that 30 plus thousand minute we're in front of Nashville. He's probably going to lose another 5,000 or so in the retreat, most of them being captured or deserted. Right, Does that thanks. answer your question, Harry? Yeah, it's a pretty good overview. I just was trying to get a, uh, a you know, decide how bad this was. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Good. Um, uh, Lee, I'd like to ask you another question, and this sure. may actually be the last question, but we'll, uh, we'll see how your answer goes and whether we might be able to squeeze one more in or so. But, um, you know, I, I find this interesting, especially given what we've seen in the last couple of years and the, the labeling of all Southern officers like Lee and Jackson's folks as traitors to the country and this sort of stuff. So now we have George Thomas from Southside, Virginia. And, uh, Thomas has been controversial and, um, He's always in the, in the center of a lot of discussions. Um, given the controversy surrounding Southern officers that wore the blue, in your opinion, when Sherman prunes his army group down after Atlanta's taken, is Thomas being cast to the backwaters Well, Sherman can take other West Pointers, good loyal West Pointers, uh, down to Savannah and elsewhere. Um, and was his commandment in, in Nashville astute or were they um, just tossing him in the back and getting rid of him because they didn't need him anymore because he's Southern and they don't trust him? I kind of can see a little of all of the above, Lynn. <laughs> uh, I think uh, what you got is that Sherman is going to put somebody who can know who can ha he, who can handle the situation in Tennessee out there but at the same time Sherman had, shows favoritism to his and Grant's favorites as well uh, you know he, he had developed uh, you know who gets the 14th floor but Jefferson C Davis who had been ingratiated to both uh, Tom uh, so excuse me to uh, Sherman and Grant in the uh, at Chattanooga uh, I basically see that as very much that Thomas uh, could be one who would uh, could mouth off to Sherman some, and I don't think Sherman really wanted that. But at the same time, I think he also knows Thomas can get the job done as well. 
as well as getting them out of his hair, so to speak. Okay. Well, I do have time to ask one last question. If nobody else is asking one and I'm looking, looking. Going, going. Anybody got a question? Uh, going, got going. One. Oh, wait a second. We do have a question here. And who's HKL? I don't know who that is, but HKL, unmute yourself, identify yourself and ask your question. Hey, Lynn, it's Hal Litchford. Sorry about that. I had some trouble logging on and, and, and uh, couldn't get all the details there. I, I'll be real briefly. Thanks a whole lot for, for a great presentation. My question concerns a really obscure part of the battle, and that's uh, Harlan Lyons' uh, obscure cavalry raid in Kentucky. Uh, I, you know, I, I, he had orders from Hood to capture all the mills he could in Kentucky, and it just it seems to me that at some point Hood thought that he would be going north of Nashville. Uh, you have any comment on that? Well, I don't necessarily know if he. Hood, again, we don't really have any concrete evidence what Hood wanted one way or the other, but I kind of see it more about, though, just getting the mills and being able to have those supply lines coming into Hood wherever he might be. So not necessarily about him being up there in Kentucky himself, but just being able to load that grain and stuff, all the wagons even, and bring them to the army. Does that answer your question, Hal? I guess so. Yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Great. Okay, folks. Um, I've hit the magical bewitching hour, and it's been a long day, and I promised Lee one hour, <laughs> and we, we've hit that point. Lee, I'd like to thank you very much. I, as always, it's Appreciate a pleasure it. to work with you. Uh, those of you who took the time to, uh, to join us, thanks very much. Um, We'll be doing this program in um, the early part of December and we'll have the registration form up relatively soon. Um, if uh, you think anybody else uh, ought to listen to this, keep an eye out for uh, when we send out the, uh, the posting and uh, send people to watch it. It's, it's available at no cost. Lee, thank you very much. Karen, thank you very much for, again, for hosting. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all good night. Thanks to everyone. It was great. Thanks. Hi. Good evening. Hey, Take Scott. Care. Good to see you. Hey, brother. Okay. We're gone. Thanks, Bye -bye. Lee. Bye, everybody. We'll catch you. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.